So it looks like the feds are about to reschedule cannabis from Schedule 1 down to Schedule 3. This is definitely the biggest cannabis news of our lifetime, but even though many people are celebrating this as a win, there are some big risks here that you might not have even thought of. And this would affect all of us in some potentially very bad ways. From home growing to legal rec markets, all the way down to new research, everything could get flipped upside down, and not in a good way like you might expect. So in this video, we're gonna look at exactly what will happen when the feds actually do move cannabis down to schedule three. First, we're gonna look at all the good things that could come from this because there are a few, but we're also gonna look at all the bad things that could happen because of this because there's a lot of those. And we will talk about when all of these new laws and schedules will actually go into effect and change everything. So if you missed the news, here's what's happening. In a historic announcement last week on August 30th, 2023 at exactly 4.20 p.m., the head of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced that they are following the data and science and the president's directive to provide a scheduling recommendation for cannabis to the DEA. And they're recommending that we move cannabis from the most illegal status as a Schedule One controlled substance down to a Level Three controlled substance which would completely change all of the current laws surrounding cannabis. So in 1970, the Nixon administration created the Controlled Substances Act that listed what substances were bad and illegal, and which ones were okay for medicine. And ever since then, cannabis has been listed as a Schedule One controlled substance, which according to the DEA are substances or chemicals defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use, and a high potential for abuse. Things like heroin, LSD, MDMA, methaqualone, and peyote. So since 1970, cannabis has been considered one of the most dangerous substances, even worse than fentanyl. But now they're saying that we should reconsider this and move it down from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. Schedule 3 are substances or chemicals that are defined as drugs with a moderate to low potential for physical and psychological dependence, like Tylenol with codeine, ketamine, anabolic steroids, and testosterone. And before we even start, I just gotta say that it's crazy that even though they are finally talking about rescheduling, that they still don't want to admit to how wrong they've actually been. Because even moving cannabis to Schedule 3 still says that it's worse than Schedule 4. And on Schedule 4, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Like Xanax, Soma, Darvon, Darvacet, Valium, Ativan, Talwin, Ambien, and Tramadol, just to name a few. So even though they want to move it to Schedule 3, they're still saying that, you know, cannabis is still worse than Xanax, Soma, Darvon, Darvacet, Valium, all of those crazy pharmaceuticals. Come to gone, man. But even moving from Schedule 1 down to Schedule 3 is still a step in the right direction, and it could actually have some good benefits. So let's look at what those good benefits could be. So the very first and probably most obvious benefit to declassifying cannabis would just be for tax reasons. So there is this special tax provision that only applies to Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 substances, and it makes any business that deals with these types of things have to pay way larger amounts of taxes. And currently, all cannabis businesses have to pay these huge taxes. But if we deschedule and these cannabis businesses are able to stay open, and that's a big if because they might not even be able to stay open, but if they are able to stay open, now they won't have to pay these humongous taxes fees because they won't be dealing in a Schedule 1 controlled substance. And that wouldn't only be good for the business owners themselves, that could have positive trickle-down effects for all of us because if the business owner has less overhead, maybe they can afford to pay their employees a little bit more. Maybe they can afford to charge me and you a little bit less when we go to the dispensary. So less taxes are great for everyone, but only if the businesses stay open. This could also mean that federal employees no longer have to take so many drug tests to prove they're not smoking weed. Because right now, federal employees and people who are contracted by the government all have to take urine tests, and if you show up for marijuana, 
you're fired, buddy. Because that's a Schedule 1 controlled substance. So maybe if we change that, some people won't have to pee in cups and lose their jobs. So that's good too. But maybe one of the most important benefits this change could have is just making it easier to do research on cannabis. Because ever since the beginning of the war on drugs, it's been almost impossible to do any research on cannabis plants. They're Schedule 1, nobody wants to fund it, it's just risky stuff and it's very, very rare. But this could change all of that, maybe. Because even though this would change all of the laws surrounding cannabis for the entire United States, and it would move cannabis off that crazy, dangerous Schedule 1 where it's been at for so long, that's not really the only thing that holds up cannabis research. And that's because of our best friends over at the DEA. See, the DEA are just sort of assholes, especially when it comes to cannabis research. And since the DEA is involved in who gets to do the testing and when they get to do it, that means that the DEA could just put procedures in place that still make it really difficult to test cannabis. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Sean Hauser, who is an attorney who co-chairs a cannabis-focused law firm, says research is still very limited by the DEA's ability to not proceed with licensure, no matter what the schedule. It's not necessarily the schedule, it's the DEA's process. Schedule 3 rules would also still stand in the way of researchers trying to study the cannabis available on licensed adult use retail markets in legal states. So even though it might make it easier, this probably won't just be like an open door to cannabis research like we really need. But what about free weed or discounted weed? We all love free weed, right? This is a fun idea. What if weed was covered by your medical insurance? Because if the government is now going to concede that cannabis does have some medical uses and that it's just as safe as things like codeine and steroids, is there a possibility that we could get cannabis covered on our insurance? Well, I'm just gonna say that I think that is very unlikely, but also it is possible. And that is insane to think of, to go from schedule one to having your cannabis covered by your medical insurance overnight, that would be insane. But health insurance in the US is sort of horrible. And even if they do end up covering cannabis on your medical insurance, that's probably gonna come with something else that you're gonna look at as probably a huge negative. And negative things are almost all we have left to talk about because I can't think of any other really obvious benefits of just moving cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. It's not like Schedule 3 means legal or less illegal. Schedule 3 drugs are still very illegal drugs. And if we move cannabis to Schedule 3 and start treating cannabis like all other Schedule 3 drugs, things could get really weird. This could go very badly. So in a nutshell, rescheduling would change everything for all of us in every state. This is going to impact every single aspect of cannabis as we know it. Because right now, everything we do with cannabis is sort of on a state by state level. The federal government deemed, hey, this is federally illegal. And if you wanna do whatever you wanna do, that's fine. But hey, this is still technically federally illegal, schedule one. So you can only do it in your state. And and it's always sort of been in like a gray zone. So for a long time, when it's come to the FDA's official stance on what they're going to do about cannabis, they usually just deferred to the DEA. The food and drug people are like, hey, this is actually like one of them serious drugs. It's a schedule one. So we just want the DEA to handle all of this. But then the DEA goes, hey, well, we already said this is completely federally illegal. Schedule one can't do it. So whatever the states want to do, that's up to them individually. But when we reschedule cannabis down to schedule three, now we might have the DEA and the FDA actually both trying to control the cannabis market at the same time. And it's not like the new law would give any new powers to the FDA over cannabis, but it would put cannabis like squarely in the realm of things they control. And it could lead to the FDA stepping into all of our state markets, like here in Colorado,
Colorado where we've been legal for years and years and they say hey actually this isn't the right way to do this and y'all have to stop and like or start over from scratch whatever you got to do because now even in state markets that have been legal for a long time the FDA could step in and say hey y'all aren't actually playing by the rules and y'all have to change everything and I'm not the only one thinking about this either in this article from marijuana moment called rescheduling won't end the war on cannabis but could open a new battlefront if we're not careful I mean this is just an opinion piece but still this person wrote while rescheduling by itself would not vest FDA with new powers it would free them to exercise existing their authority under the FDCA to regulate the state regulated cannabis industry in unprecedented ways that were politically imprudent before the DEA stepped back from the schedule one designation it could also prompt more well capitalized interest to leverage the high cost of compliance with the FDCA's drug regime and to lobby Congress to codify such barriers to entry preventing small businesses and minority and women-owned businesses from competing with them in the interstate cannabis market so they're worried about the same thing what if the FDA comes in and maybe they even team up with the DEA and now they say well now there's all these barriers for entry now you have to pass these guidelines or you have to pay these exorbitant fees or you can't even participate in the cannabis industry at all and then what if big corporations came in and they lobbied the government to say look we think that all of these thresholds you've set are way too low and then it should be like hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to get into this industry and then they give a bunch of money to the politicians who will pass those laws and next thing you know it costs 500 million dollars to get into the industry because we have FDA regulations and those aren't the only regulations I'm worried about at all what about us home growers what's gonna happen to all of us because think about the things that are considered schedule 3 controlled substances things like Tylenol with codeine ketamine anabolic steroids and testosterone do you ever ever think that the DEA would allow you to create your own codeine at home do you think they would be okay if you had a ketamine lab in your basement just pumping out bags of K no of course they wouldn't definitely not so why would that be any different for cannabis because now cannabis is going to be a schedule 3 controlled substance just like codeine ketamine steroids so what if they want to come in and say look we've actually reconsidered this whole thing and now that we're getting our hands in as the federal government and we want a piece of all of this we actually think that you shouldn't be able to grow at home because there's no oversight there's no regulation and this is just not safe sounds like something the government would do to me it's got me worried it's got me concerned are all the plants that we grow about to be illegal all over again after we've come so far and that's not just me and you think about all of the places that grow cannabis for the legal cannabis industry here in Colorado and California in any state that has a legal cannabis industry there's people there growing that cannabis to be sold in the legal industry and the rules that these growers have to follow and the laws regarding like what kind of grow facility you need are all determined by each individual state and there's really no oversight from the federal government in that regard at all so what if the DEA all of a sudden says that now anybody that grows cannabis needs a DEA license to grow it because you can't make any of these other controlled substances without a license from the DEA so now maybe we'll need a license from the DEA just to grow and that could come with all kinds of new rules and regulations not only from the DEA but also from the FDA because if we think about the types of rules and regulations that surround like labs where they produce things like codeine and ketamine like legal labs that are approved by the FDA there are very very strict regulations on how secure your building has to be and how clean it has to be there's like federally mandated procedures that you have to do and we don't have anything like that in the cannabis industry right now out of all of the grow rooms I've worked at and all my years in the cannabis industry I don't think any of them would pass DEA or FDA regulations for manufacturing schedule 3 controlled substances they just aren't set up like this because they've never had to be set up like this all of the grows we have here in Colorado are determined to be okay just by the laws we have here in Colorado these grow rooms might not even be legal in other states and if we're talking about federal regulations and DEA licenses and FDA oversight how many of the dispensaries that you know of do 
you think would make it through all of that? Because I feel like it's not very many. I feel like most places would have to rebuild everything from the ground up just to be in compliance. And for lots of cannabis companies who are already working with a shoestring budget, that's just not possible. This could put a lot of people out of business completely. And not just because of regulations either. It is very likely that this could just completely kill the entire rec weed market. Because think about codeine and steroids and shit like testosterone. You need a prescription to get these drugs. There's no such thing as a recreational codeine store. You can't do that. That's illegal as fuck. So why would the DEA or the FDA, who has for a long time been against cannabis, all of a sudden say that, you know, actually that's fine. For cannabis, that's fine. I don't think they would. I think they would say, look, if you're going to do this, it's gonna be medical only and you need a real prescription. And if a doctor writes you a prescription for something that we say isn't legit, that doctor could lose his license. So overnight, they could A, wipe out the rec market completely and B, make medical cannabis very, very hard to get. But even if that didn't happen, changing cannabis to Schedule 3 could completely change the laws for whatever state you live in. Which sucks to think about, especially for those of us who already live in a state that has good cannabis laws. The cannabis laws in Colorado are good. I like them and I don't want them to change. I mean, maybe like some very tiny things, but for the most part, I don't want like a sweeping change of our laws. But even if the state lawmakers in your state agree with that, and even if they don't want to change their laws, they might not even have a choice because some state laws are tied to the Controlled Substances Act. This article from Marijuana Moment called Moving Marijuana to Schedule 3 could have sweeping impacts for businesses, federal employees, research, and more, says essentially some states have triggering laws that make the state's scheduling correspond with the schedule change automatically and then others don't so it requires a 50 state analysis of which states do it automatically and then making sure that's implemented so that could change a lot but there's something else I've been thinking about too that I'm afraid will happen something we've been seeing a lot of in headlines more and more lately so recently we've seen lots of things like this that worry against the dangers of high potency cannabis. There's been so many worries over this high potency cannabis and people are so nervous about concentrates and they act like there's some brand new thing on the market that's like ruining the United States and damaging our youth. And even though that probably sounds crazy to you, that doesn't sound crazy to everyone. There's actually already been some states that have imposed THC limits that almost even even happened here in Colorado a few years ago. There was this woman who came into politics here in Colorado. She didn't know anything about politics, had never done politics before. She didn't know anything about cannabis, never done any cannabis research ever. She was actually just like a pediatric doctor. She was like a baby doctor with no experience in politics, but she came into politics in Colorado and said, you know what the state's problem is? Cannabis concentrates, so they're ruining the state. And she proposed a law that said we shouldn't be able to sell any concentrates that weigh more than one tenth of one gram. And she acted like that was going to solve all of our problems. You know how small one tenth of one gram is? It's not even a death. And even though that law didn't actually pass here, it sort of got close because now on all of our concentrates in the state of Colorado, there is a little sticker on the bottom that shows your recommended serving size. It's just this little tiny dot. Look how small the dot is compared to the whole package. They wanted all of the packages of concentrates to be this small. And that law did not pass here in Colorado, but similar laws have passed in other states. And if we think about Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act, it very clearly states like milligram limits in Schedule 3. Like one example it's giving is products containing less than 90 milligrams of codeine per dosage unit. So I think it's very very, very likely that when cannabis goes to schedule three, they also try to impose some kind of goofy ass dosage limit like this. Maybe a THC limit, maybe a dosage limit. I'm not sure what they'll try to do, but I'm expecting they'll shoot for a THC limit. And if they impose a THC limit like they've done in a couple of states already, that could completely get rid of all concentrates. That could get rid of all of our favorite flour. It would basically make all of this stuff that we buy every day illegal all over again. 
And this really makes no sense at all, because if there are so many potential negatives and so few potential positives, then why are we even rescheduling? Rescheduling cannabis to Schedule 3 doesn't solve any of our problems, and it might just make everything a lot worse. Why don't we just deschedule cannabis completely? Doesn't that make way more sense? I mean, alcohol and tobacco aren't on the Controlled Substances Act at all. And they're both way more dangerous than cannabis, and we can all agree on that. There's no one who disagrees that both alcohol and tobacco are both far, far more dangerous than cannabis. Yet alcohol and tobacco aren't on the Controlled Substances Act at all, which is insane because the Controlled Substances Act clearly says that all drugs with abuse potential be placed on one of five schedules. Are you trying to tell me that alcohol and tobacco don't have the potential to be abused? Of course they do. Of course they both do. Way, way worse than cannabis ever dreamed of. But Congress specifically exempted distilled spirits, wine, malt beverages, or tobacco from the CSA. So if Congress can exempt alcohol and tobacco from the CSA completely, why can't they just exempt cannabis too? I mean, I could have sworn that Joe Biden said he didn't want anyone to go to jail for using drugs or weed, and now this just isn't going far enough. And lots of people are acting like, hey, this is a big win and we're lessening the penalties for cannabis when actually we're not even coming close to doing what we really need to do. And this was recently mirrored by Normal too, where they they wrote, rescheduling marijuana is not enough. Cannabis must be descheduled. And the normal deputy director even talked about this on CNN. As a matter of policy, this proposed change by the Biden administration does little to address the widening divide between state legal marijuana laws and federal law. And he's absolutely right. This isn't going to fix any of those problems. And this isn't enough at all. And even though this is barely a step in the right direction, it might actually lead to a lot more regulation regulation and a lot less cannabis, some people are still fully against it. Like Senator James Lankford from Oklahoma who tweets, Oklahoma has seen alarming growth in illegal grow operations, foreign land purchases by China and others, and related criminal activity including execution style murder. More marijuana is not good for our families, our businesses, or our communities. He's really worried and he doesn't even understand that this new scheduling might actually put a lot more regulations on cannabis. I'm sure it all just boils down to money and like some particular interest or powers wanting control over this money. Maybe government interest or powers, maybe private companies. Something fucky's going on here because none of this makes sense. But this actually does look like it's really going to happen. We are going to really reschedule cannabis to schedule three. I mean, it's not set in stone, but it's pretty certain at this point. So the only question I have besides how is this going to change everything is when is this going to actually happen? So if we look back at this tweet from Biden, this is from October 6th, 2022. This is when he said, I'm asking Bakara, the attorney general, to initiate the process of reviewing how marijuana is scheduled. Then it wasn't until almost a year later, this August the 30th, when HHS actually provided the recommendation to the DEA. So that's a whole year from the president saying, hey, let's recommend this to them actually saying, yes, we recommend this. And if we know anything about the government, it's slow. It's very, very slow. Everything they do takes a long time. Even if there were no hiccups and everything went as smoothly as possible, this could still take years. Especially if you consider in the fact that they have to figure out who's going to be taking care of all of this. Is the FDA going to step in? What's the DEA going to do? How are all the state laws going to change? What are we going to do about wreck weed? What are we going to do with the home growers? There's a lot to figure out here. This could also change CBD, this could change Delta 8, this could change all the alt cannabinoids. This is going to change everything, and I don't even think the lawmakers fully understand how much it's going to change everything yet. They rarely understand the full implications of the marijuana laws they pass, so I don't know why this would be any different. I just hope this doesn't completely ruin everything and that big businesses or the big pharmaceutical corporations don't come in after these new changes and just completely take over everything.
Do you think that could happen? Are you worried about this too? Leave a comment and let me know what you think. I post a lot of videos and get a shitload of comments, so I rarely can respond to them all, but I'm definitely gonna be looking through the comments for this video, and we're gonna talk about this on next week's Medicated Mondays live stream. We do a live stream every Monday where we cover all the latest cannabis news like this. So let me know what you think about all of this down in the comments, and we're gonna discuss this even more on our Monday live stream. You can set a notification for that live stream right here so you can make sure you don't miss that conversation and make sure you watch this video because this video is sort of the thing that I'm worried about happening because a huge change like this is just the thing that these companies like Monsanto have been waiting for for a long time and they have the potential to destroy the entire cannabis industry so make sure you watch this I'll see you there peace